Welcome to the Out of Limits of Inner Truth Radio Show, OutofLimitsRadio.com. I'm your host, Ryan. This is The Death Show, Part 9, our second consecutive focus on near-death experiences. And there are some beautiful experiences we're going to present to you tonight. I'm so excited about it. And we also have somebody who went to hell, which is Howard Storm. I found that very interesting. And he didn't go to hell because he cut the tag off a mattress or combed his hair a certain way or voted for a certain candidate. It has nothing to do with that. We're going to learn more about his story. Let us begin today's program. Joining us now is Peter Bedard. He's a health expert and author of Conversions Healing. You can learn more about him by going to his website at conversionshealing.com. Mr. Bedard, welcome to the program. And can you please tell us about your near-death experience? Well, first, I'm just super happy to be here. I appreciate you having me online, and your show is super fun. So <laughs> thanks. I like the information, and it's pretty great. So my near-death experience, well, my experience started when I was a kid. I was uh, 17, almost 18 years old, and I was coming home from uh, a job that I had. I, I actually got a job working in a vaudeville play, which was really exciting for me as a kid to be in an adult setting like that in adult theater and and doing vaudeville because my grandfather played banjo, uh, you know, occasionally for vaudeville things back in the day. And uh, that was, it was just very exciting for me. And there was a party after the show, and my parents told me I couldn't go. So I was really angry uh, that I couldn't. I, I was a good kid. I was the one that always did what I was supposed to do. But I was really pissed off at my parents because I wanted them to trust me. I'm almost 18, and I wanted to go to this party. But they said no, so I jumped on my little Moto Bikane, which is like a moped, and I was driving home, and as I was driving along the side of the road, somebody came up in a car behind me and pushed my my bike into a parked semi-truck. And I jumped out of my body. I got to watch the whole experience. I watched my body slam into the truck and the bike slide out from the truck. And, and uh, I watched the car drive away, and I, my body was laying there in the middle of the street on this beautiful, beautiful... October night, and I remember the contrast of that experience of knowing that I was dead and knowing my body was really messed up, and being so aware of the beauty of that night. It was just this gorgeous sort of harvest moon sort of sort of night, and that contrast was very curious to me. You know, there wasn't any sadness, there wasn't any upset, there wasn't any pain, but I knew that looking at my body that my body had suffered a lot. When you looked at your and body, were you surprised at um, how good looking you were from that angle? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Were you, like, like, were you wow. surprised? Like, you're like, oh my goodness. I, I, was, I was very good. I was a 10. <laughs> no, actually, that came later. When I was a kid, I, I used to think I was terribly ugly. <laughs> I had body dysmorphia issues and all that kind of stuff. But that wasn't part of my awareness at that, at that moment in time. That realization came about in my... I think my 30s, even 40s, where I looked back on my my kid pictures as a kid, and I said, I was actually pretty cute. I was actually pretty good looking. Wow, that, that's, uh, I never thought that before. I feel the, I feel the same way. It turns out later that all these people I met, and they're like, four, I'm in my 40s right now, all these people are like, you know, I thought you were cute, but I was nervous. I'm like, well, thanks. Could have yeah, used that self-esteem boost back then. So, I'm sorry. So, <laughs> Absolutely. Let's resume the, the part where you are out of the body, you're looking at the body, you're peaceful. And what happens next? Do you see the, this white light? Do you go through a tunnel? Well, I didn't really see a white light, but it was just this really abrupt transition where I did do the tunnel experience. Not everybody does, but for me, I did the tunnel experience. And it was it was really in a flash. I describe, because I don't know how to describe things in any other way, so I use pop culture references. Now, I'm a little older than you, so you probably don't know it. But back in the day, the Six Million Dollar Man, the TV show, they vis- they had episodes where they visited the Abominable Snowman, and they have a tunnel at Universal Studios that the tram actually goes through, and it's this white icy tunnel that spins while the tram is shooting through the tunnel. That's what my experience was like. I was in this sort of corkscrew type of spinning tube, and it was all white, and it had these blues and layers of color. Of white, and that was that's very interesting. That, and I've heard this before from other people that the level of color is different on the other side, and that there was variations of color within the white, but it was still white. It's very interesting. But I went through this corkscrew, ended up on the other side, and there was nobody there. And I was in this vast open Jeez. space, 
It was beautiful, and I was really, really happy. I like to tell people that death's the best thing that ever happened to me, and I highly recommend it. So, I, <laughs> well, hey, I'm you not know, don't worry. Plenty of people are, are eating Tide Pods, so I'm sure they're going to experience it very soon. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I'm not encouraging anybody to go and and uh, you know end their life. I'm not a fan of that. But death is something to look forward to. Death is a a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful experience. It's a continuation of life. And every uh, there's no uh, there's not enough adjectives that I could use to describe that experience. It's blissful, joyous, happy, you know, enthralling. It's it's an amazing, amazing experience. So I was on that other side. I was in this blissed out state i was still curious i thought well where is everybody because there was nobody there and i had an expectation i thought that well when i died i knew i was dead i shouldn't i i shouldn't i see my dead dog and my great grandmother where i was curious where everybody was and finally someone showed up and it was a it was a it was a male but in a figure that i i had no idea about he he sort of glowed like obi-wan kenobi like he was this sort of transparent holograph but he he was asian which i'm not asian and i thought that was very curious he looked like my idea of fu manchu and he had the you know or lao tzu he had this fu manchu beard and he was wearing a suit that for some reason i thought was like from from british china you know hong kong back in 1890 so he was wearing the suit and he showed up and my heart ripped open when i saw this person i was very conscious of that experience and thinking to myself, who is this and why am I so in love with him? I have no idea who this person is, but yet my heart was felt like it was just ripping out of my chest in this painful, blissful, expansive love kind of way. And he turns to me and he says, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I obviously died. <laughs> and he says, you're not supposed to be here. And this taught me something that... I do believe in free will, and I do believe humans have that experience of free will. And because of that, I also believe in mistakes, that we can make mistakes, and that this accident was a mistake. It wasn't something that was necessarily supposed to happen. It was unplanned for, and they weren't ready for me. <laughs> and then so, uh, so they were saying, "Hey, you know, what? sorry, you know, we, we we're running behind. We got to get the maid and you know make sure." We're <laughs> yeah, so, we didn't get it really cleaned so, up. Oh, I'm so sorry. sorry. So was this was this being was this was this what you did, what you call God? Did you get the sense that this is God? Yeah, there was there was a godly energy to this being. You know, I don't know why he happened to look like. You know, maybe that was the only way my brain could understand. I don't know if this was a spirit guide. I. You know, I have no idea. There was definitely a godliness to this this figure, this entity, um, I, and maybe that was my brain way my brain could comprehend something as massive as God. I don't know, uh, but there was this definitely pure energy, pure godliness, pure love with this person that was on the other side. And when he told me I wasn't supposed to be there and I had to go back. I got really, really angry because I felt that I was being rejected. I felt that I was being kicked out of heaven. And and I didn't understand that this was a mistake and this wasn't my time and I have more things to do. I was just pissed because I knew my body was destroyed. I knew I didn't want to go back to that body. And I really liked being on the other side. It was you know, the best high, the best fix, the best joy you could ever imagine being in. So I was pissed and I told him, and uh, you know, get your beef button ready. It. Okay, I told God that to, to fuck off, <laughs> and that I wasn't going to leave. My hero, right there. <laughs> and then the next moment, I was back on the other side. Jesus. And and I was really angry, and I was watching my body uh, on the ground. I watched the paramedics come. I scared the crap out of one of the paramedics because for a brief moment, I jumped back into my body, mm-hmm. and they were seeing if I had a heartbeat. They were his face was like centimeters from my nose and I opened my eyes and he jumped up in the air and I told him that my insurance card was in my back pocket and then I jumped out of my body again and I watched them put me on a gurney in the ambulance, close the doors and drive away. Well, I, and that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the things you just brought up, you said, that, okay, that, you know, we, we have free will and, you know, this is, you can make mistakes, but it's like, well, was it your free will to stick around, or why was your free will denied? 
I have no idea. Maybe because maybe I made a higher agreement that I had more to do, or maybe they were, they just didn't have room for me at the end. I, I have no idea. I have no idea. I didn't want to stay on the other side, so in that sense, I didn't have free will because I was kicked out. But I do believe we have free will at least here on this side, and we can make choices. And I don't necessarily believe that things are destined. I don't necessarily believe that everything is meant to be. I think when you can look at it from a longer perspective, you can say, yeah, everything works out in a particular way, so therefore it is meant to be. But in that moment, I believe in mistakes, and I believe that the mistakes can fix themselves, but that was a mistake. I wasn't necessarily supposed to be over there. That's just pretty amazing about how everything happened. Now, when you, spirit jumped out of your body. Have you been able to do that since that time? You know, I did that a lot as a kid, and I have done it several times as an adult. But as a kid, I would astro project and do things of that sort all the time. But I never would I, – I never went to another realm. I never went to, you know, another place. That It was very clear to me that where I was wasn't Earth. When I was on the other side, I, it was like I said, I was extremely curious, and there was so much to see. There was so much. The air was alive. The colors were alive. They weren't just colors. They were, in a way, everything had a beingness to it, and there was this depth on the other side that was just, just remarkable. So. That experience, you know, after I left, after I came back, it's very common for people who have near-death experiences below the age of, say, 22, 23, 18, in that range, any below that age, there's a longing to go back that happens. And I spent many, many years sort of trying to get myself back there. I wasn't suicidal necessarily, but... There were many times where I came close to dying after that initial experience. And I really think it was my subconscious wanting to go back to that place of bliss. It was, you know, my subconscious creating this opportunity where I could go back if I so decided to actually exit and, and cross back over. It's, it's a, a, a careful thing. So if you do know anybody who is under the age of 22 that has had a near-death experience, talk to them, connect with them on that level that, that, you know, that is a choice and they can do that if they want to, but they're, they're not in that place at this moment in time. And that draw, because the critical mind, the conscious brain isn't fully developed, is very much there. It's kind of like a kid who wants to keep going back to the candy shop. <laughs> There's that uh, almost addictive nature where I found myself being constantly drawn back into this otherworldly thing. And it was very difficult for me to even be present in my body See, I, whenever I, I worked for I don't yeah. understand that. I don't understand this whole idea that uh, we have in this life experience. Like, oh, you know, you're a spirit having this you know, physical body experience. Well, why – if death is so wonderful and everything is so great, why you know, do this in the first why place? Why bother? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I, this is my thoughts. I think that you know, if you want to enjoy something, some people will take drugs. Like, you know, I took this drug and lasted a few hours. It wore off. I was fine. You know, some people will take some acid. Yeah, I saw colors for a few hours. Then I came back to my body. It's fine. This is like, you know, let's go to Earth. But you're, you're in here, you know, X number of years, and it could be crazy. This is, it seems like it's a one big bad trip. That the, <laughs> you, Can't we just shorten this a little bit? Can't we just, you know, do a virtual reality from uh, heaven where we experience this for 10 minutes? And, All right, that's good. Got it. Well, you know, my guess is that actually on the other side, this is prob this life, even though it's a long life for us, it is probably only 10 minutes for the soul so so i know it feels like a longer thing but my guess you know i certainly don't know absolutes but my guess is that from that perspective of the other side this really is only about 10 minutes <laughs> and you know life is what we make it and i think that's very true i i had to discover that that there you can make heaven on earth or you can make hell on earth and our thinking our attitude creates everything when you came across and you were you know, engaging with God, the person you believed to be God, did you ever get the sense that that could actually be you, the like your higher self? Or No, I didn't. I okay. didn't at all. But as I grew and as I understood more metaphysical practices and 
and stuff of that sort. As I discovered who Lao Tzu was, you know, and, and the teachings of Lao Tzu or Zen, you know, or any of that kind of stuff, I think this person might have been sort of a bodhisattva for me, a spirit guide, a representation from God that was coming down and, you know, has been with me. There was such a familiarity with this this being there was such a closeness that it makes me think of um, like uh, intertwined souls or uh, soulmates or, or something of that sort. There was a deep significance for me personally to be connected with this energy. I've read things by Dolores Cannon. He talks about saying, hey, everyone who comes to Earth has the, uh, has this guardian angel. Did you sense you had a guardian angel or guiding spirit with you the whole time? Yeah, I would I would say absolutely, and and from what I understand, I, they, this this person on the other side has kind of come to be my understanding of my guardian angel, of of those entities. But I have a lot of them, you know. I, there's a there's a whole army of them that's, awesome. <laughs> that's working with me. That's awesome. I think it's so cool to have a credit to your name. Like if you're if you're meeting people and you're on a date, saying you know I'm a pretty badass. Um, yeah, you may not you you got kicked out of that club. I get kicked out of heaven. <laughs> not only did I get kicked out, but I told God to. You know, I think that's awesome. I, that, that is my dream. That, I cannot wait to do that. That is one of the things I'm looking forward to because I'm going to say, you know, great job, great job on Earth. Terrible, terrible job. <laughs> Seriously, it, it, George Carlin, I think, always said it best when he's like, you know, this is not the work of a supreme being. This is the work of a third level temp with a bad attitude. I love that. I always wonder if George Carlin, one way, if George Carlin was God, and George Carlin came down, he's like, I'm just going to be human. I don't know. Right. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Mr. Peter Batard, I want to thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. We can learn more about you by going to your website at convergencehealing.com. Mr. Batard, thank you so much for being with us today. Ryan, I appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you. Joining us now again is psychic medium Miss Karen Reese. Learn more about Miss Reese by going to her website at Karen K A R Y N Reese R E E C E dot com. Miss Reese, you said that you've had uh, one or two near death experiences, or have gone and traveled to these various places. What was your near death experience like? Do you actually remember what happens when your soul left the physical body? You know, as a kid, I used to go out of body a lot. I still do that. And most people go out of body in their sleep state um, a couple times a week. One way to know is when you feel you're falling off your bed. And many times I've sat up next to my body. But probably about seven or eight years ago, I actually had a uh, surgery for my neck um, scheduled. But I had had this flu. And the surgery was, you know, the following week or whatever. But I wasn't feeling right. Something was really off. I thought it was the flu. And, you know, I have a heart murmur, and sometimes that gets a little tricky. Anyway, I thought, i got to go lay down. I don't feel good. I feel really heavy and slow. That's the only way I can describe it. Like, things are just slowing up in my body. And I, I'm like, well, something's just not right. So I remember going into my bed, had a wicked headache, a fever. I just was like, something's not right. And I'm thinking, oh, Christ, I, I can't do my surgery. i got to get it done. Yada, yada, yada. So I'm going in next thing I know I blacked out all of a sudden I'm out of my body and I wasn't scared and I start going through this tunnel and I've gone through the tunnel before and I'm like okay this is really interesting something's different I don't feel it's like a choice or even a subconscious choice it's like my body sounds like my spirit self is like just you know tossed out of my body thrust it out of it so I ended up, I saw a light at the end, and I'm like, okay, and I started seeing people. And I'm like, okay, this is really interesting. So as I'm starting to get closer, I'm starting to see, you know, my aunt, who I was very close to, my two grams, or so I was very close to both of them, as tiny as they were, 410, both Jeannie and Mary, little people. Um, and I saw my mother-in-law, who I adored. And in the background, there's this beautiful meadow, and I'm starting to go there, and I'm like, wow. I don't want to go back. I feel like I can stay here. I want to stay here. And as it turned out, when I got up there, um, somebody said something about, you have to go back. You can't stay here. You've just died, and nobody realizes it. So I probably was at a very low um, pressure point, you know, very low like blood pressure, heart condition, or something like that was going on. Because just before I um, went into, like, this darkness, I fell asleep or whatever, my heart was like really acting funny. I was getting chest pains and what have you. And I've actually experienced chest pains a 
people that have died when they've come in to tell me they died of a heart attack. That's a whole other story. So, uh, you know, whatever. So anyways, they told me I had died, and I was looking in the background, and all I could see is this water and these, you know, beautiful gardens. I mean, the most amazing colors, like pinks are really pink, blues are really blue. I could hear birds in the background. I felt this incredible sense of peace, all of the above. And my mother-in-law was like, you have to go back. And my aunt, who was always very, you know, lovely lady, she was very Catholic, but very, um, you know, conservative, uptight, whatever. She's like, you cannot stay here. You have to go back. You died. You need to go back. And I'm like, I really don't want to, you know, go back. I really love it here. I, I just, I've been here before. I just need to stay here. They would not let me stay here. Wow. So next thing I know, yeah, it's really kind of interesting because I was like, and can I have the choice? Go ahead. Well, before, you, before we go back, I just want to ask, when you're in this area, is every sense that you have heightened to an unimaginable amount? I mean, you said you're seeing beautiful colors, you're hearing things. What are you aware of any physical limitations that you would normally have in a physical body? Um, no, it's nice about it. I mean, you could actually fly. I've done that in out of body, like jumping off tall buildings and flying. It's really kind of weird. Um, your senses are expanded. You know, colors are, yellows are the most yellows of colors you've ever seen. Blues, like I tell you, it's like cartoon water. And I've walked on water before, which sounds weird, but I've done it in an out-of-body experience. I was only up to my ankle, and I felt something under my feet, but when you look down, you just saw straight water. It was probably 10 feet of straight, clear blue water. But it was so weird because, you know, and you can hear in the background, like birds, it's like paradise. The weather, the winds were just soft and gentle as they caressed my arms. Um, and if the, the entire time you felt calmness, peaceness, an amazing amount of love, energy, but not nervous energy. Just it was just it, when you're in that other world, the good world. It's an overwhelming experience emotionally. You just feel so intact, and you have such an expanded awareness and understanding of why things happen on Earth. Um, you know, why we don't know about everything. You know, there's there's things that happen for a reason. Of course, when you get over, you have a greater understanding why things happen and get your life review. Um, but in any event, I really wanted to say I knew my body had died. And I think a lot of people that, you know, die in their sleep have had this experience where something burps their system like a heart issue, like in my case. Um, and, you know, and... You know, that's why a lot of times you see people that pass. Other times people will come back saying they saw their mother in the dream or whatever and they've really had that experience of seeing them. But long story short, I'll never forget, I remember getting back slammed in my body. My aunt was very adamant, you have to go back. You have more work. You can't die. And I'm like, well, I visit here anyways. I really don't want to go back. And it was weird because I was, I was starting to come to, and I must have been out for a good eight or nine hours. I remember calling out to my husband. And I said, I can't believe it. I can't hear them that well. And they're sitting there talking about me and what had happened. I was still not feeling good to come in, too. And I could see my mother-in-law, my aunt, and my two grands at the foot of my bed because they wanted to make sure I had to come back. And I kept calling out to my husband, and I remember saying, I think it's really rude that, you know, my grandmothers, my aunt, and your mother are all talking about me. I can't hear them really well. <laughs> um, I think it's just really rude. Oh, yeah. I could tell you a bunch of crazy stuff. And then I'm like, oh, and I kept saying to my husband, can't you hear them? I said, isn't it really rude? And he wasn't even near me. And then he comes in and he goes, are you okay? I said, it's really rude. And I said, your mother's here and they're all talking and I can't hear them really clearly. I don't feel that good. And then I looked, I go, oh, never mind. You can't hear them either because <laughs> you're not a psychic or a medium. Oh, yeah. Wow. And, you know, it's crazy. But I did not want to come back. Most people don't want to come back. I had a great aunt on my father's side or my aunt on my father's side. His sister and my great uncle on my mom's side both had died years ago and both reported that they came back. They were in the emergency, you know, whatever medical, they brought them back and they were both pissed. You know, they didn't want to come back. And most people will tell you, unless they have a hellish experience, they don't want to come back. You're just curious, how, what does that work? I mean, you're saying you don't want to come back. I mean, this whole idea that, okay, well, we have free will. What if, don't you have the free will to not come back if you don't want to? Don't you have the free will to come back if you want to? Is that um, kind of the, yes and no, but you make a contract with God, and your astrology chart is part of that. And part of your contract is that, you know, you have certain work and certain things that you have to complete. Um, once in a while, you know, you can slip through, but that just means in the following life you'll have to finish it. Um, some people are given the choice, 
there are, you know, times where somebody will be told you want to stay or go, and somebody will say, I really love to hear about my children. Um, I'll tell you, after 911, it was terrible. Three days actually in high school, I remember seeing the two towers dropping. My brother had the same vision. And then, of course, years later, it was about three days before the towers were dropping. I remember meditating, and I remember hearing this really weird sound like a fly. You know, you hear like the buzzing of the wings or whatever. I look up, there's a moth man standing in front of me, probably about nine feet tall. As I'm looking at this moth man, which looks like, looks like a fly human thingy dingy, I'm seeing the towers drop. I'm like, oh my God, I can't oh, stop it. Yeah, and I've had that happen many other instances too. And so long story short, I remember probably maybe a month after it, I was with a group of other mediums, and we were just doing a nice little, let's take a beach meditation and, you know, that kind of thing. And all of a sudden, I remember being bothered by this young man, probably mid-30s, long, you know, brown jacket. It looks like he was one of the Wall Streeters. He kept saying, my kids, my kids, my kids, I can't go. I need to stay. My kids, help me find my kids. Help me get back to my kids. It was so sad, and I forgot his, I think his name was Jeff, he told me his name, but I'll never forget, um, and I remember looking for his name on a wall at one point, and he was so heartbroken, and he needed to be with his kids, but at some level, it was his time to go, and it was a group consciousness, he just didn't make that connection. You know, he still wanted to stay, even though before he came in, it was very heartbreaking, but at the same time, I'm like, they'll be okay. They need to be independent of you. You know, it's part of their lesson as well. And, you know, the rest is history. And in that case, you didn't have a choice, you know. It's like, you need to come over. Or at least God said that. Jeez. Yeah. Just, I can't get imagine that. Well, Ms. Karen Reese, I want to thank you so much for sharing your near-death experience and for, uh, for your other insight as well. To learn more about Ms. Reese, please go to her website at Karen, K-A-R-Y-N, Reese, R-E-E-C-E dot com. Thank you so much, Miss Reese. Thank you, too, darling. you got good energy. Thank you. Joining us now is Mr. Howard Storm. You can learn more about Howard Storm by going to his website at howardstorm.com. Mr. Storm, you have one of the most documented near-death experience I've ever seen. Uh, it's incredible. Can you please tell our audience exactly what happened to you and how it was different from all these other near-death experiences where they had some sort of majestic celestial type experience? Well, there are um, my experience was both a negative experience and a positive one. On June 1st, 1985, I was dying in a French hospital, and um, I believe when I died, although. Um, as Dr. Raymond Moody rightly put it, um, it's better to call it a near-death experience or close-to-death experience. Um, I went unconscious, and when I awoke from my consciousness, I was physically intact and was very distressed by the situation because I was an atheist college professor at the time, and I didn't believe in life after death. I thought it was all just delusional stuff. But this was more vividly real than um, the life that we experience in this world. My senses were greatly heightened. And um, unable to communicate with my wife, who was present in the room, or the roommate, I went to, um, I was led over to the doorway of the room where there were people outside in the shadowy corridor calling me and turning, telling me to hurry up and come with them. And I thought that they were um, hospital personnel to take me to the surgery that I'd been waiting 10 hours for. And I went with them, and they led me on a long, um, very um, scary journey into complete darkness where I refused to go with them any further. And they turned on me and uh, took me apart bit by bit. Um, They were savagely, you you recall, they were savagely attacking you. Uh, Did you actually feel like you would physical pain in in a human body? No, it was much worse because my senses were heightened. So just imagine your sense of uh, touch being much more sensitive than it is in this world. So it was worse. Um, And they were in no hurry about doing this. Um, Just extremely sadistic people and uh, got some kind of weird gratification on doing this to me. Um, When this... 
So good. Eventually, when there was nothing really um, left for them to do, I was all ripped up and unresponsive. Although mentally I was intact, um, I heard my voice say, pray to God, and I thought, I don't believe in God. And the voice said, pray to God. And I thought, I don't know how to pray. And the voice said, pray to God. And I remembered that when I was a child, I'd gone to Sunday school, and I tried to remember um, anything that might have God in it and came up with all kinds of um, Gettysburg Address and Sherlock's speech and the Merchant of Venice and Pledge of Allegiance, all kinds of things, and finally came upon little bits and pieces of the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer. And the people around me um, who had been attacking me became extremely agitated and were telling me in very um, obscene language that there was no God, nobody could hear me, and now they were going to um, really hurt me. But um, as I made my clumsy little prayers, um, they couldn't bear to be around them. They kept retreating away from me until finally I found myself alone in that place. And Wait, along can I just pause you? I yeah. just want to pause just for one second. Can you please describe the types of uh, things that were attacking you? And also when they were attacking you and every time they hurt you, did you feel at any point in time that these uh, entities were somehow, shape or form, a part of you? Or did you feel that they were something completely separate from your consciousness? No, they were in no way a part of me, although... Um it's hard for me to admit that they were not unlike me and that they were um, people who lived selfish lives, manipulating other people for their own gain. Um, but they were people. They weren't, they weren't monsters or demons or anything else. They were just people who had um, rejected God and what that stands for. And now they had been given exactly what they had always wanted all in their life, was to be under no authority so that they could just um, gratify their own desires. So they were lost souls. Now, you say God, you, you pray to God, they dissipate. Where are you at this point, and where do you, are you moving towards anywhere? Is, this, is, this, is the area around you getting lighter? Is it getting more illuminated? No, no, no. It's just um, abject darkness, and I'm just stuck there because I can't move anywhere. Um, I had not gone as far as they wanted to take me. I had not arrived at the destination they wanted me to go to, but um, I was on my way there. Anyways, um, I thought about my life, and um, I was very um, disillusioned with the life that I'd led and wondered why I'd ever been born in the first place. Um, I didn't feel that this was unjust, me being in this place, because of the way that I had lived as I examined it in that place. And um, in my complete hopelessness and despair, um, the memory of myself as a little child sitting in a Sunday school classroom, singing Jesus Loves Me came to my mind, and um, very vividly I felt what I had felt as a child, believing that there was this wonderful guy named Jesus who was my friend and my protector. So I called out to him, and um, when I did that, a tiny light appeared in the darkness and got very bright rapidly and came over me, and I was bathed in this impossibly brilliant white light and emerging out of it were hands and arms which reached down and touched me and I was made whole and filled with his love and he picked me up and held me up very tight against him holding me with his arms around me and my arms around him while I cried Wow, I, I can't imagine uh, the experience now at this point in time were you made aware of how all of your actions in your life up at that point had affected others and had actually pulled you into that original dark place? Only superficially from my perspective. Okay. So he took me out of that place and um, we went to a place outside of heaven where we began to communicate and he said that he had um, people that he wanted me to meet, but when they came over, they were just other beings of um, brilliant light, surrounded by brilliant light, so I can't really um, identify them. But they uh, said that they had recorded my life and they wanted to show it to me, which they did in great detail in chronological order. And in that life review, um, we went over um, not only my actions, but the effect that it had on the people around me. And it was um, 
um, not a pleasant experience. And many, many times I told them that I didn't want to see anymore, and they kept telling me that I had to watch it and understand what my life had been. So it was a great relief when we finally concluded that because it was awful. Oh, wow. So, Ed, do you mind if I just uh, relate to the audience? You, what kind of person were you? You said you were somebody with, with, that took advantage of others and just made well, sure others. I was, a, I was an all American, wonderful, 100%. You know, super guy. I thought I was terrific. If you'd ask me if I was a good person, I'd say, of course I'm a good person. What does the matter with you for even asking that? Um, I was an alpha, male, um, possessed, driven, striving. It's the American dream, you know, just what we're supposed to be, what our culture wants us to be. Were you, vis- were you um, verbally or physically abusive to anyone? Um did you, did, I was a, a sophisticated person. I mean, I didn't, I didn't hit people and stuff, but I was, you know, I didn't care about other people. I cared about myself. Okay. Did you find it particularly interesting? I mean, I don't know. I just find it um, interesting that, okay, so you're driven. So maybe you, you didn't make humanity your number one concern. So maybe, you, you know, you were just somebody who went a long way, but it didn't seem like um, anything in your previous story that you you displayed form of sad, um, sadistic, or you took pleasure in hurting no. other people, no, and I correct. find that particularly interesting. Like, why would you have to experience uh, the depth of this dark place if you didn't have that? I figured that people who were very dark we would be pulled there. Did you find it? Were you kind of surprised that you had that? That you had experienced that? No, because now I've come to understand, and believe, um, especially with the long conversation I had with Jesus after um, my life review that we weren't put here to survive or to even achieve any gain for ourselves. We were put here to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And if we don't do that, we have failed life. So that's, the, that's where we're here. We're here to come here to, to love other people and to be tolerant of others? Well, to be more than tolerant, to love and respect them, you know, not just put up with them. We're to love yes. our Right. You know, now, all right, so when you're having these conversations with Jesus, does, does Jesus and, you know, God, do they recognize sin as people think? Like, so if, say, for example, you, you, uh, it says in a church or, or institution that says if you engage in that activity, that is committing sin. Does uh, did God or Jesus, when you're engaging with them, do they recognize what humanity defines as sin as sin against them? Absolutely. And really? Because, because, let me, we are the creation of God, Jesus. He made us. He made us for one purpose, to become wonderful, loving creatures so that we could join all the other saints in heaven. That's what we're made for. And there is no other purpose in life other than that. And if we reject that because... I really believe that um, in people's hearts, and they know that in their hearts, they know that they're here to be good. They know they're here to be loving. And I also believe that people, um, most people, most of the time, um, hear that, you know, um, from the culture, not always, but they sometimes hear that. And if we um, reject it, we've rejected God. And God um, gives us free will and allows us to... uh, either choose God or to reject God and all that that entails. Do you feel that if a person has been good to others and has done that but has never partaken in any form of religion, are they still going to put themselves in a position where they could be going to a hellacious place because they were not aware of any of these uh, rules that are, are bound by religion or they're not aware of uh, these rules that could be considered sinful? Um, If a person is ignorant of religion, there's no sin there, because ignorance is not sin. Sin has to be um, intentional, willful rejection of God. Okay. So if you were to say willful rejection of God, is that defining a rejection of love, a rejection of compassion, a rejection of being aware of the suffering of another, not doing something? 
When you say willful rejection of God, how would you define that in a, if you're going to paint a broad picture? Um, well, let me, I'm not trying to be contrary, <laughs> but it's to do what one can do in the circumstances that you're in. Like, for example, um, a leader in a community or a state or a country has, of course, much more responsibility than someone who's um, going to be on a job as a clerk in a grocery store. But um, it, it depends upon your circumstances. Um, you do, you do what, what you can where you are. Okay. And just curious, when you were in the middle of the um – you go into that dark place. Did you get a sense or a feeling that, you know, while there's God, which is considered the supreme good, did you get a sense that there was there was a supreme dark being or supreme ruler of the dark underworld, or is, did you ever get that sense that there was a, there were two polar opposites? Um, in my experience, I did not no. meet the prince of darkness, but I do believe that there is such a critter. Okay, so there's a dark entity. Respect for every there. Right. And what are a couple of things that you'd recommend to people at this moment right now in order to put themselves on a path towards heaven or put themselves on a trajectory towards ensuring that their life going forward and their existence beyond the physical body is in a place of celestial and a place of peace? I would recommend three very um, predictable things. One is to... Um, start having a lot of conversation with God, which is often characterized as prayer. And I don't mean a one-way street prayer. I mean a two-way street where we both um, lift everything going on in ourselves to God, and we respond to God by listening to God, which leads me into the second part of um, becoming very, very aware of the God-centered literature, which, of course, would begin with the Bible, but would um, you know, possibly include other wisdom literature that's come down through the ages. And um, thirdly, being part of a community of people where we can be um, taught, nurtured, corrected, disciplined, and most importantly, have an opportunity to participate in um, both worship and in social justice activities. Mr. Howard Storm, I want to thank you so much. I really appreciated you sharing your near-death experience with us. And uh, again, it's, it's incredible. To learn more about Mr. Howard Storm, please go to his website at howardstorm.com. Thank you so much, Mr. Storm. Thank you. God bless you. Joining us now is Mr. Andy Petro. He is author of two great books. One of them is called Remembering the Light. Andy, can you please share with our audience uh, some of your near uh, what happened in your near death experience? Uh, yes, it happened in 1955, so it's like a long time ago. It was two days before we graduated from high school in uh, outside Detroit, Michigan, and for a uh, a senior classroom project, the last one together, we went out to a nearby lake called Kent Lake to have our picnic. Everything's going fine at the picnic, and all of my friends swam out to this floating raft about 50, 60 yards uh, from shore. So I, d I don't want to join them because in, in Michigan in June, the water's cold. So uh, finally, fi yeah, yeah, yeah. So I go running in, big belly flop, and start, start swimming, and it is really cold. But as I start as I start into my swimming rhythm, it's okay. I'm warming up, and about halfway there, I get these terrible cramps in the lower part of my 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 body, my abdomen, and and I can't kick anymore, and and my arms aren't enough to keep me going. So I'm down in the water, gobble, you know, stroking, choking, and then I get myself up again. And my head reaches just above the water line, and I look over at the uh, at the at the raft. And my friends are there, and they're jumping and, and, and waving their hands because they think we're playing the game, which we used to call us pretend we're drowning. And they're just standing there waving at me. And that's the last I saw of them. Because the, when I went down after that brief view of the raft, I never came to the surface again. So now I'm sinking farther and farther down, and all of a sudden it's getting really dark, and now it's dark, I can't see anything. And as I get farther down, the, I can feel this slimy stuff 
it feels like snakes, but it's the weeds at the bottom of the lake. And now I'm falling into the weeds. And and now the next thing that happens, now all of a sudden I'm at the bottom, but I'm in a sitting position on the bottom of the lake in the muck and mire. And, and I'm and for a moment I'm, I'm so happy because now I think I can push myself with my hands and now I can get to the top, get a breath of air, and life goes on. Well, as soon as I push my hands, they now stick in the muck about six inches. And now I'm done. Mm. There's nothing I can do. I'm stuck there. And then a voice in my head says, Andy, you have to rest. Let go and rest for a minute. And I say back to this voice, are you kidding? I'm drowning. I need air. I just want one breath of air. And the voice says, listen, if you rest for just an instant, I'll let you continue your struggle. And then I say back to the voice, do you promise? And the voice says to me, I promise. And then I say, okay, I'll let go. As the instant that the word go formed in my brain, I popped out of my body, and I'm heading towards a tunnel. I can look back and see my body stuck in the mud, and I'm saying to myself, well, that's strange because I couldn't see it before. But now I can see it. And I turn the other direction, and there's this giant beautiful, fantastic light. I would say it was equivalent to maybe a thousand of our suns all at once. And it's just shining on me and drawing me towards it. And as it draws me towards it, I say, this should be burning out my retinas. I have never seen anything so bright and so beautiful. And it just continues to draw me closer to it. And then in what I call a moment of no time, now I'm floating in the middle of a giant sphere about the size of Arco Arena, which is a basketball arena here in Sacramento. And I'm hovering in the middle, and all around, in every direction, are like miniature motion picture screens of all of my lives and all of the things that I've done in those lifetimes. Okay, so you're you're saying that in a moment of silence, you knew about past lives. You just you maybe didn't have a realization that you lived a past life, but you knew you had past lives because I saw them, and I knew they were me. In wow. that well, who moment, was some, what were some of your past lives? Just curious. Oh, they were all men, women, children, Hawaiians, Indians, other planets, other. It's just it's as I think about it now in my three dimensional brain. Mm-hmm. It's, it's incomprehensible. When I was there, hovering in what I call the the sphere of the of the life review, I knew everything exactly as it occurred, without any confusion or without any type of angst or anxiety. Okay, so I just want to pause because we sure, we, we, have, we have been curious about this. Um, we actually do ask this questions of previous or past life existences on other planets, uh-huh. did you have the human-type form and a, a human-like body on these other planets, or is it a total different existence of a different a being? Some yes, some no. Some, okay. well, the, the one that I remember the most was where it was very similar to Earth, except that on this planet we had a collective memory the species had a collective memory, and it would never forget things that it had experienced. For instance, there was no war. There was no, there was no separation. There was no anxiety. There was no killing. There was no rape. There was none of that occurred on that planet because when it had occurred for the first time, we remembered that occurred and found that it was silly and stupid and useless because we then knew that we are all one. You and I, Ryan, are the same. We're just okay. vibrating at different frequencies. When it, on that planet, that was the common psychic of the species. We knew we were all one, and therefore we lived that way. And it was, using Earth terms, a fantastic life experience as compared to what I'm experiencing here on planet Earth right now, which really isn't that great. Well, when you were looking at that particular lifetime, did you get a sense – of linear time, if that was an existence in the past or distant future, in yes. linear time. It, 
it was, that it was a big, on that planet was linear. Everything in the light is nonlinear because there is okay. no time in the light. So it does not exist. Did did you sense that that existence was something that was actually occurring in relation to real time right now? Does that does that place of existence exist right now, or do you feel that that is a something that existed in the past? Using Earth, using using an Earth mindset. Yeah. Yeah, let's say for example, we're using the Earth mindset. We we look existed, at right now. It, it existed in the future. Okay. It was a place for me to go to using the Earth time frame, using the light's time frame. Looking at as light Andy looks at it, there are two of me. There's light Andy who exists in the light, and there's Earth Andy who you're talking to right now. We're the okay, same so, thing, only we're vibrating at different frequencies. And light Andy is in the light and is in eternity and is in. In a, is in an infinite an infinite being. I'm a finite being that only has a few more years left, and I'll have used up all my time here, and time for me to get out of here and go and do it again someplace else using the Earth's time frame, using the light it's time just, frame. It's all happening at the same time. It's hard for me to know, explain that. No, no. We, I'm glad you brought that up. I've, I've been I've really been curious about this in the past. Um, well, I've just been curious to to see if all lifetimes exist simultaneously if the past and the future the present all exist simultaneously because you did mention the idea of the uh, your infinite self and if the infinite self exists if the infinite self has experienced all the the lifetimes just going back to that life you had mentioned where collectively speaking there was no rape there was no you know harmful experiences uh-huh. did you find that that particular place was a place where evolution occurred at a slower pace because you did not have so much darkness and also in that particular lifetime did you feel or sense that the individual liberty or the individual mindset was actually um, tossed aside in a favor of a more collective mindset because it sounded like the way you're describing it, it sounded like a an animal group soul consciousness the way you described it yeah it, it's uh, it it would not be what i would call an ant colony okay Okay. Using Earth terms, okay, but everything. W- Again, I'm going to be speaking in contradictions. I remember everything was transparent. We all knew what we all knew, but when we but when we were exposed to it, it was as if we were exposed to it for the first time. What does that oh. mean? That means like in the light. Once I was absorbed into the light. Now I'm part of that light. In that moment of no time that I that I was absorbed into the light, I knew everything that ever is, was, or will be. I knew it. It was contained in light Andy. Earth Andy, talking right. to you now, doesn't know squat. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, what about a couple little things? That, but b- because I'm limited. And the reason why I came back to Earth was because I wanted to experience not knowing so that I can experience the thrill of knowing after not knowing for a while. How's that's, that for that's pretty amazing. In the yeah. light, you cannot know. There is no not knowing in the light. So in order to not know, to experience not knowing, Light Andy manifests himself as a three-dimensional person called Earth Andy, born from my mother Mary in a small coal mining town in Pennsylvania in 1937 and was experiencing all the things I've experienced since 1937, which are all limited and filled with fear and angst and some happiness. But because I wanted, I, Light Andy, wanted to experience that, the only way he could experience it was to create a world and a species and a person called Light Andy to experience that for him. Right okay. now, as, as we're talking, Light Andy is hearing, this is silly, but he's hearing everything we're saying, and he's now knows what it feels like to try to explain the infinite when you're bound by three damn dimensions and time. When you're describing Light Andy would be a, a sense that it's it's your higher self. It's the, yeah. it's the all-encompassing one spirit. And I, I guess... I'm going to ask a question on behalf of our listeners out there because I feel that they would probably want to know this question. Is that sure. did Light Andy 
happened to give the lottery numbers to Earthbound Andy as a you know parting gift. Say, hey, by the way, you, know, you came, you <laughs> met me to tell you a couple of right. numbers. Yeah, have, well, that, that's, let that's, Earth and Andy enjoy a, a little of bit of uh, the good life. Yeah, I, I get that question a lot of times. Really? And, and, and the answer is, what I remember is that that if if Light Andy wanted Andy, Earth Andy, to have a fantastic, wonderful experience of oneness and unconditional love, then I wouldn't have left. I'd still be there with me. See what I'm saying? Okay. The reason I came down here was to experience fear, separation, hatred, segregation, all of these things which you cannot experience in the light because in the light we are all one. There is no separation. There is no hierarchy. There is nobody in charge in the light. We are in charge. We are it. We are the big light composed of an infinite number of smaller pieces of the light, like Light Ryan and like Andy, and and an infinite number of others that make the wonderful existence of it. Okay. See, I, I, I keep running out of words to try to... No, no, I'll tell you, this is great. Andy... When you were in the light, did you ever get a sense that this particular evolution on Earth was one of the most challenging evolutions in terms of, uh, you know, the pain and suffering that a, a soul could experience in all other evolutions? Or are there other existences that you picked up or sensed that were much harder than this one? In, in both directions. Much harder and much more wonderful. Okay. All of the infinite incarnations that I viewed. Some of them okay. were just horrible. It's, well, I like, mean, even, though mean things ho- are, even, even though things are not that great on, on planet Earth right now, I viewed some ex- existences I had which were just terrible. What, and, kind and of, what just, were those existences like? Well, I mean, it, it just it's like, it's like being alive, uh, being a slave in South Carolina in 1803. Okay, what kind of okay. life is that? Okay, how 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 do you how do you live a life like that? It's horrible. Okay. Uh, yes, okay. I remember that. I remember what? those lifetimes and and on other planets with other varying degrees. Okay, I'll listen. Okay, so there were other lifetimes of various planets that they say they were, they were kind of slavery. So there, there, you're, there could be much worse physical existences that we're not aware of because for some reason we, what I've gotten the understanding is that this is the hardest uh, life existence you could possibly have. Mm, not, not, so, so from, not from my review. I've had, I've had more, plenty more that would make this look like a walk in a, a walk in a park. Okay, so I, I don't know. I guess the curiosity is getting the best here. I wonder what could possibly worse the worst existence I, I can I can possibly fathom in this lifetime is, is being in North Korea. I, I can't imagine anything worse than, than being in in there. It just seems awful. I mean, I can't imagine something that could be more difficult. I just, you know, in terms of having a total loss of individuality, individuality and freedom. Uh-huh. So I don't know. I guess, well, but but think of. Think of North Korea as yep. as the best part of a whole world in which there are other places that are even worse than that. Wow. Uh, okay. And it, so souls will willingly go to those places like they just need to experience that type of experience. Can they just look it up in the Akashic records and say, you know what? OK, not going to do it. No. Yes, because there, are, because there are only there right now. There are only about eight point five billion souls that decided to come to planet Earth to figure out what's going on here in the year 2016. Okay? Yeah. So out of the infinite number of souls, uh, eight and a half billion is not a lot of people, not, not, not a lot of choices. Okay? So, yes, that, that's, that's all part of the process because, okay, l- let, me just, let me set something that, that became obvious to me. When I was mm-hmm. in, this, in, the, in the sphere of the eternal now and looking at all of my incarnations and all of my experiences, as I was viewing them, I remember in the light as light Andy. It's different than as I'm talking about them as Earth Andy, because Earth Andy 
experiences sorrow and wants justice and wants it, there's all kinds of things that because we're a separation based species because that we 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 decide to be separate more than we decide to be oneness that's what we're experiencing we're experiencing all the hell bound things that we create when we don't need to do that all we have to do is stop go to that silent space between your thoughts because that's where every soul abides and remember we're all pieces of the light and we're just choosing to experience this none of this is real what do you mean Andy I mean I've been unreal for 78 years now this is not real this is this is choosing to experience separation choosing to experience hatred and fear choosing to experience loving giving choosing to experience being saint teresa or being hitler all in the same species two opposite ends of the spectrum are choices well uh, the, from the light looking at it from the light see there's no judgment in the light there's no good so or bad some there's, people you think come to be here specifically for the purpose of being a sociopath and a mass murderer for their evolution Really? I'm, I'm just telling you that's what I remember. No, no, I know. I you just, have to it, ask it kind them, of somber about that's it. That's not me, okay? All I know is about about Earth Andy. And Earth Andy chose to come here to struggle during his lifetime. First of all, to have this memory of being in the light and struggling for 25 or 30 years thinking that I was crazy and never speaking about it until I was almost 50. And then oh. all of a sudden... Oh, my God. Yes, it's true. Why? Because I wanted to experience years of not knowing, followed by the, followed by the, the fantastic feeling of finally remembering and knowing that I'm a piece of the light, that none of this that's happening to me is relevant. It's just an experience that I chose to experience. And if I want to, if I want to experience something else, I can just change and experience something else. And I will, because three-dimensional space and time has a finite existence in it. And when that, when that finite period is over and I'm back in the light, then I'm doing you're gonna, something You're going to go someplace else. Yep. But don't forget, from the light standpoint, it's all happening at the same time. See, I got to I have to say silly things. You know what I'm saying? Well, you know, it just maybe dawned on me when you said that thing that uh, people are coming here to experience all different types. They're coming here to be good. They're coming here to be evil. I, I always wonder, like, well, if that being said, then if there are people that are trying to make the world peaceful or trying to make the world a more loving, compassionate place, doesn't that imply in one way, shape, or form that they could actually be infringing upon collective humanity's evolution because maybe it's like, well, you know, don't do that. The dark needs to come in. The dark needs to be here. You're infringing upon humanity because that's what they're here to do. It kind of makes you wonder, what's the point? What's the point of doing something positive? What's the point of doing something negative? If everyone is here to collectively experience something else, what's the point of even doing anything to either hurt or help the world? Because when I as I was looking at all of my experiences in the in the sphere of the eternal now, I noticed that every time that I chose to do something that was unconditionally loving, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, the reason is, ir is irrelevant, that, that as I'm looking at me, I could see a aura, a manifestation around me and those that I was doing loving kindness to of a beautiful white and gold and silvery aura that was just so wonderful, so unconditional loving. And and I know that I felt that when that happened at that point in time on earth. And then when I was looking at some things that I was doing where I was finally getting even with the bastard who did all this to me, now it's your turn to feel mm -hmm. like I felt. There was no glow. There was no aura. There was no warmth. It was muck and 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 
and ugly, and okay. I didn't want to be there. So it, everything is a choice. We all have, I, I have a choice to be unconditionally loving or, or to be a bastard. I have a choice. It's my choice. But what are the con- what are the consequences of doing either? I mean, if if evolution is evolution, where and you have in your infinite yep. spirit and your infinite time, what's the? I mean, what is the motivation or attention for for doing positive? What's the motivation or attention of doing negative? Because you know, you brought up something interesting. You said, okay, when I was doing positive, you know, this this beautiful glow came upon. And there was yep. love around. Okay, that that's wonderful. But then you did negative. Then okay, so there was muck and so there was negative uh, activity going. On. But if you're infinite, what's the point? What's the point of doing positive, doing good, or doing evil where i mean if you're all going to progress on the same path if you're infinite because because infinite andy cannot experience that infinite okay. andy knows that he knows what separation is he knows what hatred is he knows what unconditionally loving is he knows what it means to give your life for another unconditionally while you're here on planet earth but he hasn't experienced it in order to experience these things, the light creates places like planet Earth, populates them with the species called humanity, and let each piece of light choose what they would like to experience. Wow, so so, like so at, is, the, at nope. the end, is there, mm-hmm. see, again, in the light there is no judgment, there is no hierarchy, there is no separation. We are all one. Well, we are all what if you hurt someone? What if what if you hurt someone and you're you're harmful and you're just sadistic? I mean, doesn't isn't there some kind of consequence for for doing that? Uh, I don't like to say this because, but the ant. I'm just tell you what I remember. I'm mm-hmm. not I'm not judging. I'm not evaluating. I remember. It's just a, you're that just there observing. Is it's no, an observation. There is no judgment. Okay. There is no judgment. There are choices that I've made in my lifetimes that were good and created unconditional loving effects. And there were choices that I made which were filled with hatred and horror and those, all of those I experienced because I, Light Andy, wanted to experience what I could not experience in the light, which nobody can experience in light because they know it all. In order to experience something like hatred, you need to you need to know well what does it really feel like to be hated? In the light, you can't there you can't feel there there is that does that, that word doesn't even exist up there. We're all one. We're all unconditionally one collective loving humanity. The light. No, if you are Andy in the light. Yep. Is that Andy in the light or you know Ryan in the light or anyone else in that light, is that the peak of evolution? Is that uh, if the, the quote-unquote Andy in the light, is that the, the farthest you will ever go for evolution um, where your soul is right now, the higher self? What, what I remember was that, that being in the light is ever-changing, is ever-knowing, and every to use an earth term, every moment is experienced as if it's experienced for the first time. So there is no boredom. There is no, oh, God, I've done this before. Why well, are you sitting on a cloud playing a harp? That's not, that, none of that exists. In the light, the light is the light. And, and for me, I've been spending like 50-some years trying to explain, trying to find the words that that explain what does it feel like to be alive in the light, and there are no words. At best, I can come up with some half-baked analogies <laughs> and parables. Okay, but they're they're they're. It's like Andy. What does it feel like the moment that you left your body and you were filled with unconditional love at that moment of no time, from complete terror and fear and fright and pain and angst of of having no oxygen in my body for five six seven minutes however long it was be thinking my brain is going to explode from the pain to complete unconditional loving peace joy happiness and warmth in that moment of no time the moment i let go and left my body okay that experience they said okay well andy what does it feel like tell me how it feels like 
the closest I can come to is pretend you're looking at a birthday cake and you're one year old and there's one candle on it and you light the candle, okay? That mm-hmm. candle now represents the most fantastic, joyful feeling you've ever had in your entire life on Earth. And now take that candle and put it on the surface of our sun. The surface of the sun is how I felt the moment I left my body. Wow. So how do you compare that? It You don't. It's you're completely it's comparable. It's the same. They're both flames, but one is in a candle and one is in in our sun. Uh, now, when you were having all these other existences from, uh, from what your experience was, does every physical incarnation or other existence does that enhance and grow the uh the light and or the infinite you does that further expand the consciousness that you would call the infinite self uh what this is what i remember i remember being in a light and i remember that there was nothing to learn there was no learning there was experiencing so i wanted to experience whatever i whatever I chose to incarnate in, planet Earth, planet X, planet Y, 1700s, 2525, 600 BC, whatever, wherever it is that, that I decided to incarnate, it was because I, Light Andy, wanted to experience that. And if you multiply that by an infinite number of lights, that's what we have, that's what we call reality in some sense. Wow, so this whole existence, this holographic thing that we're experiencing right now, the physical life incarnation, it's just a, uh, it's an illusion. It's a, it seems it, like it, it's something that we're just, we're, we're here to experience. We're, we, well, let me see if I can wrap my head around this and tell me if I'm going wrong. We are all knowing, but because we are all knowing and there's nothing left to learn, we purposely we set our brain to re-experience the knowing, to re-experience the joy, the suffering of knowing what we already yes. know. Yes. Oh, wow. Let me a quick example. When, when, when you're born, or the, the moment that you're born, your, your body, your, your mind, the essence knows everything there is because you just came from the light. You just lowered your frequencies so that you could manifest yourself in three-dimensional space and time. Okay? Now, different people come remembering more or less of them of the light for instance einstein uh being whatever he was 25 years old in a patent office came up with the theory of, where did that come from he didn't even that didn't exist it was what he remembered from the light i saw a little kid on a tv show the other day who's three years old and plays mozart better than anyone i've ever heard before well how can that be you say well because when he came down from the light, he cap he. I th- one of the words that people phrases people use is is an old soul. He rem- he remembered that he knows that that's part of him. So we all choose what we're going to bring from the light with us to experience more knowing or less knowing, so that we can make our choices to choose between unconditional love and separation, fear, and hatred. Okay. And you know, I'm just curious. What what's the difference between an old soul and a new soul? I thought. Well, I mean, if we're all one, aren't we all like an old yeah. soul? Basically. Yeah. I was just using a term that we use here right. on Earth. Say, whenever somebody seems to, be, wow, where did he? How could he know that? He's five <laughs> years old. You know, he know he he knows how to do this. That somebody who's 55 years old doesn't know, it and he's been practicing all his life, and he's a five year old coming, he does it immediately because he came remembering that, remembering oh, that. Excuse, um, there was an author who we've uh, we never had an opportunity to speak with, but she she had died last year. Her name is Dolores Cannon, and she had this book called The Three Volunteers. I'll, I'll never forget the premise about it. She said that there were three generations of spirits that are incarnating on Earth, and they were coming here without any previous Earthbound karma. And the reason why they were coming here was because without that previous Earthbound karma, they were destined to raise the vibration and the frequency of Earth. I didn't know if that idea had resonated with you or if you had any kind of insight or um, insight as far as what the future of Earth would hold or what the changes Earth was going through. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with what she said. I, I, I know everything is vibrations. Okay? Mm-hmm. Everything is, is, is vibrating energy. 
We are all pieces of the vibrating oneness, which is the light. And and the choices that, let me say this. I knew when I was in the light looking at, I knew how everything ended. I knew all the endings of all my lives because I know everything when I'm in the light. When I decided to come back here, I decided to come back not knowing because if I'm here and I know the answer, then I can experience not knowing. So why just why come at all? Stay up in the light and you know it all. I don't have to worry about it. Well, so can... I don't. I don't. I don't prophesize the future because it's unimportant to me. What's important is at this moment in time, how am I acting? How am I loving? How am I hating? How, what choices am I making? So this, my whole life, the last 78 years, have been a series of making choices. Some really good, some not so good, some terrible. But they're choices that I make because I wanted to experience that. Kind of, no. not, not, to me, it's not any more complicated than that, but it's just I know it sounds really silly because based on my teachings prior to my near-death experience, Nothing that I was taught from a religious, philosophical standpoint did I experience in the light. So none that's of the stuff that they said about religion. I mean, no one, no, no one's going in there for for no. eating meat on a Friday. No, nope. no one nope. is in hell for going to eat meat. No, no. no. I, don't, I, I can eat. I can have sausage on my pizza after the football game. After all, I didn't realize I spent you can't oh. a whole lifetime <laughs> not doing that. You know, we've um we've done previous shows where. We we trying to figure out well trying to develop a way for people to communicate with their higher self or if you want to call it light Andy. Do uh-huh. you have you been in communicate with have you been in communication with light Andy and is there anything that you'd recommend that people can do to facilitate communication with their their light version of themselves and maybe you know try to renegotiate some of the terms of which they're here and say listen, um, you know I don't want to experience something very bad. Can we just you know, kind of make the experience more peaceful. Is there? I mean, that's what I'm trying to allude to. That can you communicate with your higher self, and can you renegotiate the terms for what you're here to experience? Uh, I do it all the time. I'm always really? in. I'm always in contact with Light Andy. How do you? Because how Light you, Andy exists to... in the quiet space between my thoughts. So what that means okay. is any form of meditation, mm-hmm. any form of quiet, any any time that I want to get I want to get out of here to use that term get out of earth I just I just, I just don't I just don't want to deal with it anymore I can't deal with the political issues anymore I can't I, I, just, I don't want to do that it just causes <laughs> me all kinds of gyrations I can't I can't believe that I'm seeing that then what I do is shut everything off and go to a quiet peaceful place close my Damn. eyes listen to my breath Stop thinking, and then there's Light Andy. And Light Andy says, and that's your, here I am, and here you are. Where I am, Light Andy is. Earth Andy is, because we are one. There is no separation of us. We're just playing a game called Life on Planet Earth in 2016 where you're doing things here because Light Andy and Earth Andy agreed before you came down here that you wanted to experience these things. So how horrible is it? It's not horrible. It's because you chose it. Well, if you don't want it, then don't choose it. Choose something else. I can't. Yes, you can't doesn't exist in the light. That word doesn't make sense. Can't doesn't make sense. What about... uh, Spend time in the quietness of your inner peace. That's where it is. I'm, I'm really I'm, glad I'm, you brought that up. Oh, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, sir. go ahead. Go ahead. I'm saying what you just described. A lot. Of, I mean, it sounds like you're really fo- talking a lot about meditation, and people really talk about the the virtues of meditation, and that yes. when you're praying, you're speaking to God, and apparently you're meditating, you're listening to God, you're listening to your higher your higher self. Because no. when I when I speak to God, 
what I remember from the light is that using the earth term God, which I don't use very often because it's been kind of bastardized over the centuries, speaking to God is speaking to my higher self, which is speaking to the light. And I'm a piece of the light. So I am it. I'm a holographic piece of the light, meaning that I'm... It's my my best example is if you take a holographic print and you smash it with a hammer and it and it breaks into fifty pieces. Each piece of that holograph is contains the total picture, only it's a piece of it. Well, I'm a piece of the light. I'm a holographic piece of the light. So I'm just like the light, except I'm not the whole picture. I'm a piece of the picture, but I'm equal to the whole picture. So. To me, being peaceful and talking to, to using the three-dimensional word God is talking to Light Andy, and Light Andy and Earth Andy are the same. It's like back in the old days, I used to, I was taught, taught about a guardian angel. The guardian angel was some angel who was looking over me to make sure that it, that it would, he or it or she or whatever it was, would help me well. In the light, there are no guardian angels, but the concept is still there. Still, light Andy, so he's looking at Earth Andy, and is very happy with with what's going on. Because why? Because that's what we choose to do. Okay, that's it's, it's very interesting. I'm really glad you brought that up. And uh, you know what? I I can't believe it's worth forty minute mark. Is it okay to ask you two more questions? Sure, as long as you want. Uh, it's, uh, it's, I, I mean, I just. Kind of just flows. I was, wasn't expecting this. All right, we have we've had a gentleman on our show in the past named Rich West, and yeah. he's talked a lot about soul contracts and the reincarnation trap. That sometimes that people when they pass, they could be coerced or manipulated into perpetually returning in a physical life incarnation. I'm wondering if you've ever had any kind of insider experience in that where. You know, in your departure from your uh, physical body, that a soul could be in such a state of disarray that they could be manipulated into returning indefinitely. Uh, is that something you've ever experienced, or does the soul consciously aware that it has left the body and that it is on to its next evolution, wherever it sees fit? What I remember from the light is that is that nothing happens to to a soul that the soul doesn't choose to happen. So there is no puppet master up there somewhere pulling strings to say, oh, okay, well, you're going to redo this life because it's this kind of crappy right now. You're going to do this. That that wasn't in the light. What was in the light was I would I would come back and, and re-experience similar things because I chose to. There are a couple of key words in the light that that define it in its nature. One is unconditional love, which means everything is loved unconditionally. So you don't have to do anything to be loved. There is no doing. And, and unconditional love has only, has only one level, unconditional love. There is no little bit of love, a lot of love. You don't love some things more than other things. You don't love some things less. In the light, everything is loved at the same unconditional level. That's number one. Number two, in the light, everything is transparent. There are no secrets. There is no unknown. The word why doesn't exist in the light because why assumes that you don't know. Otherwise, you wouldn't ask why. Since there is nothing unknown, certain earth words don't exist up there. And number three, nothing happens to anyone without them choosing it. And I know you're going to say, well, wait a minute. You mean this guy chose I'm, I'm tell All I'm telling yeah. <laughs> you is what I remember, and I remember in the light that choice is what makes the light work. And it's all choice. And no one wow. is in charge except all of us. We are all one. There is no separation. Okay, so Mr. Andrew Petro, I mean, it was it was an amazing interview. I really am so thankful that we we had an opportunity to talk to you. And 
your book is called Remembering the Light. And what was your other book, sir? Alive in the Light. Okay. Highly recommend you get both of these books. I just I'm so happy that we we got a chance to talk. I really enjoyed our interview together, sir. Okay, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure sharing the light with you. Joining us now is Robert and Suzanne Mays, near death experience researcher, one of those NDA researchers. You can learn more about them by going to the website at selfconsciousmind.com. Robert and Suzanne, welcome to the program. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Well, I have to say, you go to your website. It's very different. You have a lot of interesting information. Let's talk about the first thing is you actually discuss the idea that when people die and they have these near-death experiences, they come back with different types of perception. What is this type? What is this perception? Is this abilities? They have the ability to, I don't know, uh, control their environment, influence their environment. Basically, I mean, what are some of these uh, abilities that you've observed for some people that come back after they die? Well, <clears throat> the, the, um, I guess it, it falls under uh, a number of different things. Uh, what, in our view, what is happening is that, that the mind is uh, the, the essence of a person, the mind entity, we call it, uh, or you could also say the soul, separates from the physical body. Uh, and then comes back to the physical body in the near-death experience, and uh, the mind itself is energetic. And when it comes back, there is uh, it doesn't quite fit the same way as um, as it was before the near-death experience. And so the uh, there is a uh, the energetic body of the person is. Uh, not contained fully within the physical body. And so there are uh, immediate um, energetic effects, we could say psychic effects that people have, where uh, they have the ability to, uh, for clairvoyance, they have healing abilities. Uh, some people have psychokinetic abilities where they can move objects. So if I may rephrase a little bit this this. Um notion of the mind and what happens during the NDE, that there is a loosening of uh, another form of the of sheath of the body, the life body, from the physical constraint of the, of the body and the physical senses. And it remains loosened after the NDE, so that there's still this capacity to be functional in the, in the physical world, the world of materiality, and still have an access to another domain, another super sensible domain. Right. And, and, and what that means is that uh, in a near-death experience, the, uh, there can be several aspects of the experience. One is where the person is out of their body but still within the physical realm. And there they have perceptions, but uh, they're unusual perceptions because they are also part of this higher dimension. And the higher dimension allows their perceptions to be, you know, 360 degrees. Uh, you can see something from all sides at the same time. Uh, it's, uh, and their perceptions are uh, outside of, uh, so in a way their perceptions are somewhat outside of space. Uh, and also they have the experience of uh, uh, seeing their past in a life review, and that is uh, 360 degrees. It's usually described as holographic, and they have the ability to see scenes, uh, potential scenes uh, from the future. So the, their senses are ultra-lucid? Ultra vivid in the out of the OBE or the out of the body experience and the near death experience, and um, if the, their senses are not constrained to the body of time and space. I say is that you have your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind apparently records everything that happens while you're in the body. Everything that happens. Now you step out of the body. You go into wherever realm you went to as you are dead. You attain that information, but your brain yeah. and your body are not with you on there. You come right. back in the body. You know it existed. How does your brain 
process that? How does your brain process that knowing that it has not been there? You have not recorded that information while being physically alive. You recorded it when you were not alive. And also, how does your brain respond to that? Because, you know, now you've got this new stimuli that's happened, and how is your brain supposed to, you know, kind of reset itself? Right. Well, we, we, uh, our theory is that the, all memory, in, uh, you know, from physical life and in all of your experiences, plus in, if you had a near-death experience, all, all of the memory of the near-death experience, all of that is not in your brain. It's not recorded in your brain, actually. It's recorded, or so to say, impressed on uh, the mind. And so when you are in the near-death experience, you take your memories with you because that's part of your, your essence. When you come back with the memories of your near-death experience back into the physical body, you've got all of those, uh, those memories. But one thing is different, and that is the, the experience in out, out of body in the near-death experience is hyper-real. And we have found recent research in the last three or four years has found that the memories are more real, have more memory characteristics even than memories of real events. In other words, the memories of an NDE are significantly more uh, characteristics of uh, the, that that the person was actually involved in the in the experience rather than imagining it rather than it being a hallucination and uh, and of course the other aspect of these um, perceptions out of the body are that they are veridical that they can be ver- verified uh, and and they are accurate almost all memories of the physical realm during an NDE the memories of what they perceived are accurate when they are checked yeah. Mr. Robert And Suzanne Mays, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. To learn more about Robert and Suzanne, near-death researchers, please go to the website at selfconsciousmind.com. Plenty of articles, plenty of videos. You will not – you'll be on the site for hours. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much. Okay, everyone, that concludes Part 9 of The Death Show. Special thanks to our eloquent guests. The next two – Parts of the Death Show are going to feature more near-death experiences, so we we'll hope you continue to stick around. To learn more about the Outer Limits of the Truth Radio Show, please go to our website at outerlimitsradio.com. Want to be heard or seen in front of millions of people? Want to be an expert on TV or radio? Goldman McCormick PR is a New York City-based public relations agency that specializes in traditional and social media placement for law, finance, media, and corporate-based clients. Goldman McCormick PR also are specialists in website development, radio show creation, press conferences, media training, and so much more. Check out GoldmanMcCormick.com for more information. GoldmanMcCormick.com.